Thank you for checking out the sermon video here at Hope Church. We're excited that you came across this message and are tuning in. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Do us a favor and text new to hope to 94090. After you hit send, you'll get an immediate response from our team with a link to a short form for you to fill out so we can get to know you better. The message you are about to watch is part of our current sermon series, Proverbs, Everlasting Wisdom for Everyday Life. Once again, thank you for joining us today. Enjoy the sermon. I was recently reading a book by Pastor Charles Swindoll. And as I was reading it, I came across a short powerful story that I want to share with you, and then I want to ask you a question today. Here's the story. A young man walked up to a payphone in order to make a call. After the fellow dropped in his coins and dialed the number, he made the following comments. Hello, could you use an honest, hardworking, capable employee, the young man said. No? Oh, you already have one. Well, thanks anyway, he said and hung up the phone. As he turned away, he was smiling and began to whistle his way back to his car. An observer nearby was listening to the young man's comments on the phone and then approached him and said, excuse me, I couldn't help overhearing you. Am I right in thinking that you were turned down for a job? Yep, grinned the young man. So what have you got to smile and be so happy about, asked the observer. The young man replied by saying, because I am the honest, hardworking, capable employee they already have. I was just checking up on my job. Now, as we begin, I want to ask you a question that will hopefully allow us to personally apply that story. Here's the question. If they were asked, what words would those who know you best and watch your life associate with you? Think about your family your friends, maybe your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates, if they were asked to give a few words to characterize you, what words would they use? Let me give you a couple of examples. It would be great if they would use this word to characterize you. If they were to say, when I think about him or her, I think about... Compassion. Here's another word that some people may use. Busyness. Maybe some of the people around you, when they think about your hurried schedule or all that you have going on, they would think about this word when they think about you. Here's another example of a word that they may use. The word friend. Here's one that all of us would love to be used in association with us, wise. We would all love to think that those people who know us and watch our life would associate us with wisdom. Here's one just for fun. There are some people I know, there are people who live in my house, that when I think about them, I associate them with this word. I want to show you one more. This is really going to set the direction for our time together today. Is this next word a word that those who know you and watch your life would associate with you? Integrity. If we were able to listen in to an honest perspective from those people who know you well and who watch your life? Would they say that you are a man or a woman of integrity? 
Integrity has fallen on hard times. In many ways, integrity is a forgotten biblical standard in this day and time. It's not a way of life that is cherished or celebrated the way that it should be. In most cases, people are more surprised by those who have integrity than those who do not. And because of that, our society elevates many things in terms of importance above having integrity. Now, some people may see this word and think, well, integrity is overrated or integrity is unnecessary or integrity is unimportant. But as we look at the scriptures and specifically as we look at the book of Proverbs, over and over and over again, we see the significance of integrity. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 13. As a church family, we are journeying through the book of Proverbs to discover what we have called everlasting wisdom for everyday life. We believe that This book, the book of Proverbs, contains wisdom for every area of life at every stage of life. So I want to read for us Proverbs chapter 13, verse 6. So I want to invite those who are here on campus, I want to invite you, if you're watching with us online, welcome to our service today. I want to invite you to lean in with us as we look at this powerful verse of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 6. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless. But wickedness subverts the sinner. Here is the big idea that we're going to spend our time today talking through. A wise way to live is to pursue integrity. A wise way to live is to pursue integrity. Biblical wisdom calls us to a deliberate, determined, resilient life of integrity. Now to unpack this and give us some handles tonight from a biblical standpoint, I want to share with you three biblical principles about integrity. And here's the first one. Integrity is a big deal. Integrity is a big deal. I don't know how to communicate that any simpler or any clearer. Integrity matters. In 2018, I had the opportunity to travel to the continent of Australia It was my first time in that part of the world, and myself and pastors Vance and Teddy went to Perth, Australia to lead a conference for some ministry leaders. And as we planned that trip, we planned to, after the conference, leave Perth and travel to Sydney for a couple of days just to do some sightseeing. And so we had a great conference there in Perth teaching the principles of the life of a Jesus follower that we teach here at Hope Church. And then after the conference, we traveled to Sydney for just a couple days to hang out and to play. And there were several places that I wanted to see there in Sydney, Australia. And one of them was the Sydney Opera House. If you've ever seen a picture of Sydney, Australia, you've probably seen a picture of the Sydney Opera House. And so we decided to take a tour of the the opera house there, but we also decided to splurge and buy some tickets to actually go to a show at the Sydney Opera House. And so the night we were headed there, we were at the hotel, we were about to leave, and I chose on that trip at all times to have my passport on me and with me. And I remember walking out of the hotel room and I hit my pocket where I knew I had my passport and I hit my pocket where I knew I had my phone. Those were the two most important things to me. And so we go to the opera house and we get in uh, to the, the place where we were going to see the show. And the way it worked out is pastors Vance, and Ted, pastors Vance and Teddy were sitting in one place and I was sitting in another place. Well, about five minutes before the show started, Vance texted me and he said, hey man, I'm really not feeling well. 
And I know that we've got to travel tomorrow, so I'm going to go back to the hotel, take some medicine, and get some rest if you want to come down and sit in my seat beside Pastor Teddy. So I rushed down there, sat down beside Pastor Teddy, and the show started. I was so excited to see a show at the Sydney Opera House. Well, about five minutes into the show, I hit my pocket where my phone was to make sure it was there, and then I hit my pocket where my passport was supposed to be, and it was not there. And I immediately went into a serious panic. I began to sweat bullets, and I'm thinking, I'm in another country. We're supposed to leave tomorrow, and I don't know where my passport is. So the first part of the show was about an hour. And so I'm spending the whole hour thinking through, where is my passport? And I concluded that the most likely place it could be was in my original seat. And so as soon as the lights came up for the intermission, before there was even a voice on the speaker, I ran down the aisle and ran up the stairs back to my original seat. Now, there was a person who had been placed there because that seat was empty. And I rushed over to the seat, pushed the two people to the side who were blocking my way, saw my passport between the seat, and I grabbed it. And then I realized what I had just done to those two people. And this is all I could say. I am so sorry, but my passport is a big deal. Now, I tell you that story because it's an example of me pursuing something that was essential. Not trivial, not negotiable, not flexible, something that was essential. And as we think biblically about integrity... I want us to understand today that it's not something that is trivial, negotiable, or flexible. Integrity is essential to following Jesus. And I believe that as we look at a society that does not put a priority on pursuing integrity, one of the reasons for that is because society does not believe that integrity is essential. They don't believe that integrity is a big deal. I love what Warren Wiersbe said. He said, integrity is to personal and corporate character what health is to the body. And 2020 vision is to the eyes. A person with integrity is not divided. That's duplicity. Or merely pretending. That's hypocrisy. He or she is whole. Life is put together and things are working together harmoniously. People with integrity have nothing to hide and nothing to fear. Their lives are open books. In our verse that we're looking at today in the book of Proverbs, we see a description of a person whose way is blameless. Another way to say that is a person who walks in integrity. And in the book of Proverbs, over and over again, we see the importance of our beliefs and our behaviors both being honoring to Jesus. But that's not the only place in the scriptures that we see this emphasis of integrity. Look at this verse from Psalm chapter 101. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house, in the integrity of my heart. I hope that today will be a clear message or a clear reminder for you that integrity is a big deal. Integrity means that in a Christ-like way, my private life lines up with my public life. Integrity means that what I say and what I do are the same thing. It is a God-honoring, integrated lifestyle, and it matters. Charles Stanley said this, Although we usually think of integrity as simply being moral in what we do and what we avoid, it encompasses so much more. It's being an undivided person. In other words, Who we appear to be on the outside to others is who we actually are 
in our innermost being. The first foundation I want to lay for us, both here on campus and those who are joining us online, is this. Integrity is a big deal. Here's a second principle I want to share with you about integrity. Integrity begins on the inside. Integrity begins on the inside. I love this verse from Psalm chapter 51. The Bible says, Behold, you, meaning God, desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. I want you to notice what that verse does not say. The psalmist here does not say, God, you desire for me to appear moral and put together on the outside. That's not what the Bible's telling us. This verse in Psalm 51 is connecting the impact of truth inside of us. As we talk about transformation or lives being changed, there are really two different perspectives that we can have about how someone's life is transformed. Here's one of them. A person is transformed from the outside in. One perspective on how life change takes place is that a person is transformed from the outside in. And here's the idea. By focusing on external activities or moral behavior, I can somehow change what is on the inside or work my way to favor with God. This perspective is a deceitful lie and the premise of works-based religion. Religion says I can change myself by what I do on the outside. We've all probably heard this famous phrase, fake it till you make it. That phrase is very popular and suggests that by imitating confidence, competence, and an optimistic mindset, a person can realize those qualities in their real life. But as we talk for a moment about this perspective of transformation happening from the outside in, I want you to hear me say this today. That famous saying, fake it till you make it, is the opposite of integrity. Because integrity is the opposite of being fake. But as I said a moment ago, there's another perspective on how a person's life is transformed. And that is a person is transformed from the inside out. Here's the truth of that. By focusing on intimacy with God, his life in me will overflow to change what is on the outside. That's the gospel. That it's not up to me to change myself but God desires to do a work inside of me centered on a personal relationship with him. And as I am transformed on the inside, his life overflows and impacts what takes place on the outside of my life. Clyde Cranford in his book, Because We Love Him, said God does not ask us to change ourselves from the outside in. He changes us from the inside. A pursuit of integrity does not start by trying harder on the outside. It begins with a heartbeat of surrender that says, Lord, I can't, but you can through me. There is no such thing as being too spiritual, too moral, or too mature to make mistakes. We all need the amazing grace of Jesus on a moment-by-moment -moment basis if we are going to walk in integrity because a life of integrity is the overflow of the life of Christ in us. I want to pause for just a moment right here and speak to those who are here in the room as well as those who are watching online and say that as we talk about integrity today, the Lord may already be speaking to you. He may already be revealing some things about your life that need to change 
because you know in this moment they are not honoring the Lord. And if that's you in any way, I just want to say to you, your first instinct today should not be to try harder. It should not be to say, okay, this week I'm going to do better. If today you realize there are areas of your life that need to change, your first response should be one of surrender, inviting the amazing grace and life of Jesus to fill your heart to overflow so that on the outside, you are changed by his amazing grace. Let me show you this in the scripture. One of my favorite verses in the gospel of John is John chapter 15, verse five. You see this inside out so clearly in this verse. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Do you see the order? Abiding first, fruit second. Life change happens from the inside out. You see that right from the lips of Jesus. Integrity is about who we are, not about what we do. But as you know, who we are on the inside does impact what we do and how we do it. So it is critical for us to see the distinction between a perspective that says life change happens from the outside in versus the gospel which says, I am transformed from the inside out. And here's why that's such a big deal. Because when our life on the outside takes priority over our spiritual health on the inside, our integrity is in danger. I'll say that again. When our life on the outside, how we appear before other people, when that takes priority over our spiritual health on the inside, our integrity is in danger. So there's two foundations so far about integrity. We know that it's a wise thing in life to pursue. It's a big deal, and it begins on the inside. Here's the third and final biblical principle about integrity. Integrity benefits my life. Integrity benefits my life. As we've learned over the past few weeks from the book of Proverbs, in every moment... We have a decision to make. We can choose to walk in wisdom or to walk in foolishness. And it's up to us. We can choose to walk wisely or we can choose to walk foolishly. And the scriptures are clear that when we choose wisdom and we choose a life of integrity, God responds to that in specific ways. Now, integrity is an uphill battle. There is a cost. The Bible says wide is the gate that leads to destruction. So many people are going to go down it, but narrow is the gate that leads to life or the gate that leads to wisdom. So it is an uphill battle, but the Bible is clear that when we walk in integrity, there are specific ways that God responds to us. So here's what that means. When we are verbally responsible, financially accountable, personally and privately dependable, The Bible gives promises for us as the people of God. So for you and I, what can we anticipate from a life of integrity? Well, here's a couple things that we want to apply today. First of all, we can anticipate intimate fellowship with God. When we walk in integrity, we can anticipate nearness to God. A life of integrity leads to the personal delight of intimacy with God. Let me show you this in the scripture from Psalm 15. I love these verses of scripture. Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? In essence, who can be near to you, God? Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. When we choose to walk in the blameless way, 
We are walking closer with Jesus. It paves the way for an intimate love relationship with Jesus. When righteousness and integrity mark our lives, it paves the way for nearness with God. So when we walk in integrity, we can anticipate near, close fellowship with God. Secondly, we can anticipate walking securely. In our verse tonight from Proverbs, listen to these words. Righteousness guards the one whose way is blameless, but wickedness subverts or twists the sinner. Proverbs chapter 10 says this, he who walks in integrity, I love this, walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found. When we walk in integrity, the truth of God grounds us in a way that we do not experience otherwise. I mean, think for a moment about the culture that we live in. We live in a culture that is constantly pulling us away from the things of God. We live in a culture that says the external matters more than the internal. We live in a culture that says what's popular matters more than what's right. Culture says my way matters more than God's way. Culture says the temporal matters more than the eternal. Culture says feelings matter more than what is true. So how on earth are you and I in a culture like that going to step away from a life of compromise to live a life of integrity? Well, the Bible says that when we walk in integrity, even though sin is tempting us and sin is pulling us, we walk securely in the truth and peace of God. As we walk in integrity, we can anticipate walking securely with the Lord. And then finally, one other thing we can anticipate that benefits our life as we walk in integrity is being directed by God, being directed by God. Proverbs 11 says this, the integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Let's be honest. No one plans to wreck their life any more than they plan to wreck their vehicle. Yet when we look around us today, there are so many lives that have been wrecked because people have gone in the wrong direction. I love the clarity that John Phillips brings about this in his commentary. He says, righteousness keeps one's life on course and leads one in the right direction. I believe that when we walk in integrity, our daily decisions and the will of God are much, much clearer. One other quote I want to share with you because I think it's so timely for us in this day and time. It's by a man named Daniel Aiken. He says, without the anchor of scripture, what one generation finds wrong, the next will tolerate. The next will accept And the next will affirm. The tug of society, the tug of culture is pulling us away from the truth of God, the life of integrity that we've been called to. But as we walk in integrity with a sameness about our behavior and our beliefs, the Bible says that God will direct us. So those are three foundations for us today about integrity. It's a big deal. Integrity begins on the inside. And integrity, a life of integrity benefits our life. This is not a subject that is easy to study or a subject that is easy to hear but it's important for us to hear it because all of us are a work in progress. None of us have arrived. 
None of us are perfect, but we are continuing to strive as followers of Jesus toward Christ's likeness. And we need the word of God. We need the teachings on integrity to sharpen us on this journey. And today, as we try to apply these principles, I really feel like there are two categories of people, two categories for us in terms of those who follow Jesus that I want to speak to for just a moment. First of all, you may be here and you've already identified an area of compromise in your life that is obvious. As we're talking about integrity and sameness, you already know in your life there's something that you need to deal with. It's very obvious. It could be a lie. It could be a mistake. It could be an addiction or some other sin or struggle. If that's you, I want you to hear me say this, whether you're here on campus or you're watching online, if that's you right now and you know there's an area that is obvious that you are compromising in, God has exposed that because he desires to work in your life right now. And you are not alone on your journey. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sin, if we confess our struggle, God is faithful to forgive and to cleanse. So if you're here and you're listening and you're watching this service today and you know there's an obvious area that you need to deal with, here's my question to you. What needs to change in your life for you to begin to pursue integrity? What needs to change in your life in order for you to begin to pursue integrity? God has exposed this for a reason because he wants to work in your life. So what needs to change for you to begin to pursue integrity? Well, maybe for you, that's not you. And there's not some glaring area that's really evident in your heart or your mind. So for you, here's what I would say as a second group. Spend some time this week seeking Jesus specifically about your integrity. As we continue to journey through the book of Proverbs and you spend time with the Lord, maybe this week, just say, Lord, is there any way you want to work in my life when it comes to integrity? Seek his heart this week and listen to his voice. And as he speaks to you, I challenge you to obey. A wise way to live is to pursue integrity.